Mira la izquierda, mira la derecha. ¿Qué ves? ¿Dónde estás? In a world that seems to change daily, what will you do next? Welcome to the Next Steps Show with Peter Vesquez and co-host Aisha Kreutz. A starting point for discussion y un poco de dirección. Bienvenidos de nuevo al radio show en una misión. Soy yo, Peter Vesquez, y mi amiga... Aisha Kreutz. Hola, Aisha. Hola. ¿Cómo estás? Así, así. Bueno, bueno, me alegra saber, me alegra saber. Bueno, vete otra vez. Y Eso. señor Roberto Sabaje. Hola. ¿Cómo estás, señor? Uh, great. Great, güey. Well, bueno, me, me, me alegra saber, sí. Irrega. Vamos a hacer el show todo en español hoy. No, we're not doing the whole thing in Spanish. Y, y, ¿Pero por qué? It's, <laughs> because, been, it's been eight months. Because we haven't taught people enough Spanish. I got you. See, my I Spanish is good you. enough that I can understand the things. I can't just always reply. So that's a little challenge Spanish. to our listeners to go back and see how far deep they can go into their memories and remember <laughs> high school Spanish, yeah? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, joining yeah, us again. You know, what's Igra? Igra? Yeah. You know, that's the letter Y. Right, but why? Oh, you're saying Y. I uh, got it. You got it. E. Yeah. E. Yeah. yeah, and. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't place that quick enough in, in your uh, ah. Spanish. And I was like, what is that? So. Bueno, let me, let me tell you. He's pretty good at that. Let me, about. So it's, like, it's like you spoke Spanish a, a little bit during your life. Every once in a while I did. You know, I grew up with mom and pop. <laughs> You know, they, they, they were like, don't talk to me in English. And one day I tried, uh, don't talk to me in Spanish. And, you know, they reminded me shoot. that we were Puerto Rican. So you, so you spoke Spanish in your house? After I didn't sit after telling him that, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I had loving parents. I loved my parents. Um, well, yeah, we this butt Spanish isn't going to spank itself. That's right. <laughs> Why do you think God gave us butts? <laughs> well... We're so gonna they leave can be spanked there, by your parents. I, you know what? I agree with that. Yeah. I, rearing your children. Now, listen, I, I, I don't believe that any parent should beat their children at all whatsoever. However, I do believe that every once in a while we need to catch their attention. <laughs> and sometimes you got to just... Catch a rod just, or a shoe. Just you know, just remind them. Well, especially if they're going to hurt themselves, right? I'd rather spank my kid and have them be... Uh, have that type of, you know, pain than right run across the street and get hit by a car. And let's let's make it clear right. too. I mean, I think in ninety nine percent of the cases, spanking is not beating a child. No. Correct. No, no, no. Right. no. Actually, right. it's loving a child because sometimes again you've got to just get their attention. Yeah. So, anyways, wait, 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 real quick though, you know, so my grandmother and, uh -oh. and I, I quickly had to change this and in, in because of different day and age. So growing up, uh, I live with my grandmother often, and uh, she would always she. she You know, I'm 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 colored, you know, chocolate colored. This. Yeah, just well, you know, I'm on the radio. People may not know, it's right? More, more caramel. But yeah, yeah, I'm caramel, chocolate, you know, mocha. But my grandmother, she used to say, like, when we get in trouble, right? And she was coming after us, and she's, I'm gonna beat you like I own you, mm -hmm. right? That was like our <laughs> saying, you know, growing up. And so then when I had kids, right? We we're just talking about spanking. I'd be like, G you better stop on beat you like I own you, and then. That doesn't play well today. Mm -mm. Like CPS, you know what I mean? My kids would say things like, you know, mom's going to beat me. And then we'd be out and be like, oh, wait, that doesn't sound <laughs> well, <laughs> right. The reference. <laughs> you the, know what the, I mean? The Excuse reference me. itself today is a good tune. You know, Probably. Yeah, no kidding. Actually, that's Excuse me, I can get home and get spanked. I'll, I'll, I'll see you guys later. Yeah, I, yeah. I'll tell you what, though. My parents were clear. You knew when you were going to get yes. a butt beating. There yes. was no, I mean, you you knew it. You right. came home, you put your head down, and you're like, and where can I find a book that I can stick down my pants? Yeah. Until yeah. your parents realize it, and they're like, drop your pants, boy. Yeah. Be <laughs> Anywho, it's we're winners. I love being a winner. I love when we uh, set Winning. out to do great things. But, you know, on Wednesday night... Was it Wednesday night? Yeah, it was Wednesday night. There was a uh, nominating convention, uh, a Republican nominating convention. Where at? Uh, 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 at the Italian American Community Center. Uh, Marcusini was uh, Monroe County. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Marcusini was uh, nominated to run for uh, 
Uh, county, county executive, executive, very exciting. You know, he did really well against Luis Slaughter, if you remember. Boy, he did. What was that, 800 votes that first time yeah, he, he came very up? very close. Uh, we have uh, uh, Sandra Dorley, who's running again. I love that woman and, and what she does in that office. I mean, she takes... She, she, she's, she's a no-nonsense kind of person, and I think we need people like that to continue in those offices. And then the family court was nominated on, and there were three contenders. And you know what? My wife was one of those people, and, and out of the three, she, she won. Wow, she got like nine, over 9,000 votes that evening. So, But I want to share with you a little bit of her speech that she gave that evening because I think it's important for people to understand what is it that, that, that you know, here in places like the Voice of Liberty, of parents, those of, those of us that are looking for non-political people to be judges. But, Bob, if you don't mind playing that clip, this is what I believe we should all be looking for uh, in all our family court judges. I also understand that the, a judge, the decisions a judge makes are not temporary and will have life-altering impact on the entire family. I take that responsibility very seriously. The family court has many challenges. I believe a missing piece in our family court system is a systemic approach to figuring out root cause of issues, creating barriers for the family. Identifying the root cause leads to ensuring proper resources are provided to that family. Family court cases cannot be handled with a one-size-fits-all approach. I think an important component to that is looking beyond the courtroom in order to identify environmental factors, creating barriers, and contributing to the trauma the family is already dealing with. From matters of domestic violence, child abuse, sexual abuse, and juvenile delinquency. Unresolved trauma is a significant contributing factor and often overlooked. You know, she quoted uh, Frederick Douglass where he says that it's easier to raise a child, um, and I'm going to butcher this one. Yeah, of course, you say, you probably know it by heart, uh, but it's easier to raise a child than it is to fix a broken man. Right, to build strong uh, men than to repair broken children. Absolutely. Right. And, I, you know, I think the whole point of her speech there was to say, listen, when it comes to judicial races, when it comes to races that are going to make decisions, and not that policy makers don't, obviously, but when it comes to, to, to the interpreters of law and the application, especially when it comes to children, uh, when we have people there that are focused on identifying things like trauma, thinking out of the box, I mean, I've never heard a speech like that before. I, okay, I'm biased. It's my wife. You know, I understand that. But the reality is, when was no, the last good. time that we've heard anybody say, hey, listen, we keep overlooking these things? Yeah. So, no. anywho, today we have a guest Right. Uh, I I think this guy, his bio is the first time I read it. You introduced him to me, Aisha. Um, And and I was just excited to see it as we talk about some of these things, because when we talk about freedom and liberty, guess what? Dealing and overcoming traumatic events is critical to be able to find that freedom, both spiritually Mm -hmm. and uh, and 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 secularly, really. And we talk a lot about doing things from a biblical perspective. And today, uh, our guest uh, is going to help us kind of explain this. Today's guest is an American patriot. He's an Army veteran. He was a high school English teacher, a Christian uh, a musician, a Bible conference teacher, a veterans disability claims representative uh, with the New York with New York State. Wow, uh, a veterans program administrator and a Tea Party a spokesman throughout upstate New York. He also wrote a book that's been used for teaching throughout much of the world, titled "The Three Dimensional Leader Negotiation." Negotiating your mission, resources, and context. Ladies and oh, wait a minute. He's also the pastor and founder of Liberty. And we're going to get to that because here we, YSL Stations, we are the voice of liberty. We're going to talk about his church, Liberty Christian Fellowship Church. Ladies and gentlemen, join us today in welcoming, who's now best known as Pastor Earl, the Honorable Pastor Earl Wallace. That's quite an introduction. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Well, Pastor, after reading through your through your bio, I, I you know I have to say I was very impressed, and I thank you very much for coming on the show today, so we can discuss some of these issues. Uh, you know, the, for our listeners, I mean, here we we focus on next steps, and, and, and our whole intent is to be able to provide uh, uh, people who think that they can't take. 
uh, that next steps to their want to go. And we're going to we're going to help kind of break that down. But today we wanted to talk a little bit about how do we do that from a biblical perspective. But before we do that, Pastor Earl, if you don't mind uh, sharing a little bit about who you are, um, but also what in your life caused you to kind of be where you are today. Well, I guess my testimony along those lines would start uh, with, uh, in 1980, I was a, I had gotten out of the military, and I was a, a junior in college in 1980. And um, a little old lady's prayer group walked up to me after church service, and they said, at our Wednesday night prayer meeting, Mr. Wallace, and these ladies are older than my mom, uh, and some of them were friends of my mom, and said, um, God told us that you're going to handle this particular woman's case against the Veterans Administration. It goes back to 1954. I was born in 1956. I tried to look compassionate, but they read, <laughs> they read, read my face, and one lady says, look, he doesn't even care. <laughs> so um, uh, and one, of the other ladies, one of the ladies told them, the, the, the protagonist, uh, the subject of the, of the prophecy, um, well, dearie, don't tell them the gory details. Just tell them what God said. And the lady looked at me, and she said, I know you think I'm crazy. But God told us Wednesday night you're going to handle this case with me. So I get done with college, and I uh, I, I teach high, I study to be a high school English teacher. I thought God had called me to work with kids, which I've done most of my life. And um, I'm playing Christian music, and, and I, I get my first band together. I'm still te- and I, while I'm teaching high school English, I have 92 percent of my students pass New York State Regents exams the first year, and then I had 95 percent the next year. First year, though, I thought I was a failure. I didn't get 100%. I didn't realize that you know, teachers, uh, the statewide average is like 50%. So I, I make a long story short, I got this overwhelming feeling that I had to go do something else. So I went to a couple of a Bible school. All my circumstances got shut down there. The Lord sent me home. And then I did something that I said I would never do, and that's take a state exam. Because um, I was looking for desperate for work. All, my door, all the other doors seemed to be closed. And I ended up at the New York State Division of Veterans Affairs in uh, July of 1987. Uh, maybe it was September or October of 1987. That lady at her little prayer group discovered where I was. That I was working in the industry that would be um, that would be necessary for me to work in to fulfill that prophecy. And they hounded me and told me, "God told you to, to, to handle this case." I said, "I've talked to all kinds of people. No one can solve this case. Everybody's tried." Um, and besides, I know that you told me I'm not so sure it's God, but they kept bugging me, and one lady said one day, this is not going to stop you to do what God says. I said, well, you're going to be sorry. I'm going to file the case, and then you'll be sorry. We'll, just, you'll get, we'll get a no, and this will be the end of it. But um, I, along the way, I discovered what really happened to her. And um, to make a long story short, in 1994, okay, now, seven years from the date of the prophecy, approximately, I filed a claim. And seven years later, 14 years from the date of that prophecy, the federal government had to pay her back from 1994 back to 1954. She got a 40-year God check. Nice. And um, then um, I always tell people now that if God uses you to do unusual things, brace yourself, because unusual things are about to happen to you. I, I, I like Little your... old man. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I said I like your reference calling it a God check. <laughs> Hey, it's true. Well, it wasn't me. <laughs> and we know 40 years, 40 is God's number, right? Yeah. Like the number of the completion of your trial, so to speak. So um, anyway, make a long story short, a little old guy man walks in my office over a course of several um, weeks, a couple months. He uh, takes me to lunch. He, we talk a little bit. He um, basically offered me a no-show job at the New York State Legislature. He walked into my office for the first time. He says, hey, I'm from the handlers. I said, what are the handlers? He goes, well, we handle politicians and government officials. Eventually, they wanted me to take a no-show job at the New York State Legislature. Um, He said, you walk to the front door, you punch the clock, and then you go out out of the side door and assign me to an assemblyman's office. You You walk out the side door and you go to Albany Law School. I said, I can't afford law school. They said, no, 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 we'll pay for everything. One day he comes to my office and he says, come walk with me. He's got a little stretch Mercedes Benz outside, and behind is a new Buick. He goes, this is your car. This Buick is for you. This is the lifestyle we have prepared for people like you, Mr. Wallace. We want to help you get to a higher position of authority where you can even help more people. Years later, I learned that they had figured out that 
they're, 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 what they do is they find people that are doing unusual things, but more so, his first words to me were, I know you were written up by your bosses twice and told to leave that case alone, but you didn't stop. You actually got congressmen and federal judges to do something that nobody wanted to do and release records that everybody wanted kept um, hidden for 40 years. You're a very persuasive man, Mr. Wallace, and we want to help you get to a higher position of authority where you can even help more people. They wanted to corrupt me before I knew who they were. Wow. And uh, fast forward, another part of I, I, I do all the things that you said in that in my bio. I wrote a book <laughs> called The Three Dimensional Leader, and in 2012, I was in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, staying at the same hotel that Obama had just left from Malaysia doing his apology tour. Mm. I was expecting to get a really, really hard time in Malaysia because my book, The Three Dimensional Leader, is based on uh, the leadership styles revealed in the book of Judges in the Bible. And Samson, Samuel, and Deborah are the templates. Samuel's a one-dimensional leader. He's got great one-dimensional leadership is all about me, not the mission. Samuel's got great gifts from God, but he doesn't use them to, to further the organization's mission. He just uses them to chase girls, and his downfall <laughs> is the result of those self-inflicted wounds. Deborah is an example of a three-dimensional leader. She, she understands mission, resources, and context. That's the subtitle of the book, Negotiating Your Mission, Resources, and Context. She knows God's mission. We've got to get the bad guys out of land. Uh, her, the resources are, are the people. People are your chief resource. Barack is her chief leadership resource. When her chief leadership resource says, I'm not going to go unless you come with me, she doesn't micromanage him. She doesn't belittle him. She shows up, but she stays in her lane. She fulfills her prophetess role, and he fulfills his, and she empowers him, encourages him to fulfill his general role. She says, look, I'm right here with you. Whatever they throw at me, they're gonna, you they're going to throw at me. I'm with you. Go do your general thing. A lesser leader like Saul would have tried to micromanage things, mm-hmm. step into other person's roles. And so... Um, we got these three dimensions of leadership, and the reason, the reason I was able to teach high school English and do what the Lord wanted me to do there, the reason I was able to do these things in state government was because the Lord had been speaking to me about the Book of Judges for a very, very long time. I studied it most of my adult life, never really preached or taught on it, um, but um, when um, uh, what? I knew that uh, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I got a statewide agency that was in disarray, and the Lord used those concepts, those three-dimensional leadership concepts, to turn that agency around within six months. By, by our fifth quarter, a year and a quarter, we were exceeding all of our customer segment categories between four, 6 and 24%. And then I knew, okay, I'm going to write a book. This, this, this stuff works. God, God works. And That's the right. challenge we have is that we, we, use, we use a lot of cliches about God, like God helps those who help themselves. God will never give you more than you can handle. He always gives us more than we can handle. His, his, his goal is to get you to the place That's where you right. rely upon him. Yeah. That's right. So we, as I began to apply, my challenge was I, I always had been preaching and teaching. I had a Christian band when I was teaching high school. English. I had a Christian band when I was a state veteran counselor winning that case. And I started going to Christian camps and do songs, do, do like concerts. And one of the camps called me up, and they said, would you pre- come and preach next week for us? They'll take one of our weeks of, of teaching. And so that started 15 summers of me, um, two to three weeks of summer, moving my family to various Christian camps and teaching the Bible for a week. The challenge of that is I was very, very busy. I'm, I'm, running, a, I'm running a government program. I'm, I'm, a, I'm in the Army Reserves. Uh, I've got a Christian band. I'm an elder in a church. I have a Bible study in my home. So we, we were extreme, and we were homeschooling our children. Uh, we were extreme. I was giving guitar lessons Homeschool at one life. point. Just so we were very, very busy, but I had to keep up, and, and, I, and the Lord would never let me in, into full-time ministry. Mm. And um, I, I kept thinking I got too many lives. But fortunately, I was the kind of person that could live on maybe four to five hours sleep a night most of the week, <laughs> one or two nights a week. I'd have to get six to maybe seven, eight hours of sleep. But a lot of the time, I could just live on, a, on very little sleep. And so um, I, 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 at some point I kept saying, God, you know, I would like to have one life. Why don't, I, why don't you just let me go to Bible school? Make a long story short, people get upset when I say stuff like this. When, when, I, when the Lord started me on what's in that pamphlet that I sent, the PDF of the third edition I sent to Aisha, the yeah. Lord told me when, when he gave me that pamphlet, he said, if I had sent you to Bible school and you had lived in a church, 
you would have never been able to apply the Bible to every aspect of life, including physics. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. most churches just play church. Mm-hmm. And you hear the pastors talk in the church, in the church, in the church, and this week in the church, in the church. But we don't live in church. We no. live out here in the real That's world. Right. Yeah, yeah, and, and our testimonies, my pastor and I, our assistant pastor and I, our testimonies are all about the different work that the Lord had us doing all of our lives. Um, you know, applying the Bible to every aspect of life, including physics. That's right. So but, you started. But in 2012 in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, let me just finish with this. Uh, I was on. I, I was expecting a very hard time from these people. I thought they're going to open up that book, and they're going to see very prominently chapter three that um, I, you got Samson, Samuel, and Deborah, a successful Israeli judge, kicked Ar- um, Arabs out of Palestine, basically. And uh, they're going to get on the phone with their jihad bros. And I'm not going to get out of here alive. As a matter of fact, two nights before I flew over to Malaysia for the first time, been there five times. Uh, um, I've been in Dubai also four or five times. But the uh, first time I flew to Malaysia, I thought this. I woke up in a cold sweat two nights before. My wife says, what's wrong? I said, this makes no sense to me. I don't understand why. And God has shut down all my circumstances. I mean, he forced me to go to Asia. I wasn't going to go. And, um, but uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, the uh, my wife said, why don't you go pray and ask the Lord what he's doing? So I go to pray. I come back about 45 minutes later. My wife says, well, what will God tell you? I'm like, he said, he's not bringing me over there to kill me. And so she said, well, okay, then have faith and go. My faith was, I told her, I said, maybe I should go pray some more, mm-hmm. longer, because it might be I'm not bringing you over there to kill you, dot, 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 yet. It made, <laughs> it made no sense to me how on earth could a person with the book that I've written, and it's really a secular business book, it's just that I got the template from the Book of Judges. It quotes some scripture throughout. I once was on a plane, I, well, I was going to go overseas, and then somebody had scheduled me to be on a plane that would land in Kuwait for two hours. I thought, this would be great. I'll go to Kuwait. I won't be able to get out of the airport, but I'll run to the airport, and I'll grab all the newspapers I can, and I'll see if what the Kuwaitis tell me is true about their, their newspapers. That the a quarter page of the front page every day is reserved for um, uh, some SWAT team that, that, that dragging someone away who had, out of their house or whatever, mm-hmm. office, whatever, who had insulted some member of the royal family. And in these countries, these kings, the last, the previous king of Saudi Arabia, not the one I think is cooperating with Donald Trump, but the previous king of Saudi Arabia, he, he had 800 wives and concubines. There were 16,000 people running around the country who were considered royals. They got a succession to the throne. The, the overwhelming majority of those people aren't getting near it. But they're still royals. You could bump into someone or insult someone. And, and in those countries, you insult the religion. The government forces are the ones that come and take you and bring you to the sword movie imams in the square. I have a video of a woman being beheaded in a Saudi Arabian parking lot. Yeah. Like and, the, and they don't do it very something. nice. They don't do it very nice at all. So, Pastor Earl, we're going to have to go to break here in just a couple of minutes. When we come back, though, I was hoping we can talk about uh, Liberty Christian Fellowship Church and, and, and kind of what are you doing there, what led there, and then we're going to get into the biblical charge uh, for leaders, if you don't mind. Not, not at all. All right, that sounds good. Ladies and gentlemen, in, uh, you're listening to our guest today, Pastor Earl Wallace. In studio with my buddy Aisha and Roberto. We'll be right back in the next step show. Here's a special message for veterans and surviving spouses from Alpine Manor. You may qualify for a special benefit from the VA. After applying for funds received for aid and attendance, your stay at Alpine Manor could be as low as $600 per month. Be sure to call for details. At Alpine Manor, their pride is personalized care for seniors who are not yet ready for a nursing home. There are supervised activities and medications, full laundry and housekeeping services, three dietary approved home cooked meals, and a bedtime snack, all provided in immaculate surroundings. Be sure to call for details on this new program for the veteran in your family. Keep the golden years carefree years at Alpine Manor, nestled in the picturesque rolling hills east of 390 in Livingston County, just 20 minutes from Rochester. New York State Health Department license. Call 346 5880. That's 346 5880 for a no obligation tour or information, or visit alpinemanor.com. 
The fair tax replaces the income tax and abolishes the IRS for good. But that's not going to happen if the current crop of politicians have their way. Fair Tax New York is looking for motivated citizens who are willing to contact candidates and get them to sign the fair tax pledge, promising to push for fair tax if elected. Call Fair Tax New York at 585-944-0588. That's 585-944-0588. Make that call today. Hi, this is attorney Christine Demo Vasquez. For more than 18 years, I've provided quality legal services tailored to the unique needs of each of my clients. I take the time to educate my clients about the law, explain the legal process, listen carefully, answer questions, and keep my clients informed throughout the process. An attorney who understands the complexities of the family court system, call attorney Christine Demo Vasquez at 585-427-0675. 585-427-0675. Peter Vasquez and Aisha Kreutz, the next step show on the WYSL stations. Welcome back. Welcome back to the next step show. On the phones, we have the Honorable Pastor Earl Wallace from Liberty Christian Fellowship Church out in the capital region of the great state of New York doing wonderful things. You know, the Bible says that uh, we, we, we have to be leaders. I mean, it, it, if you believe in Christ, you you pretty much say, I want to be a leader. Would you agree with that, Aisha? Well, everybody has a lane, but yeah, you know, I mean, we're it, supposed to be your, the salt and light. Right. and Yeah, yeah, but, you know, we're supposed to lead not, in the... Leaders are the salt and light. Yeah, yeah, in, in that respective, you know, how people lead, it's all going to be different. Some of us leaders but, even display the salt and light on our beards and hairs. <laughs> and salt and saying. peppers here, and we're in... No. <laughs> oh, um, man. <laughs> but, you know, again, how you be, how to be... Uh, how to stand, how to lead in a culture, especially one that is right um, uh, taken over, right, or given over to the enemy, right, mm-hmm. uh, and and how you are able to stand against tyranny in a way that is godly, right? Well, that well, I think is the part that, especially, uh, uh, uh Earl, Pastor Earl had said, you know, before, right? Like we live in the world. We are in the world, not of the world, That's right? Correct. That is part, you know, again, what I think kind of what you're saying, right? And how we do that. And too many times, right? The, the, as everybody else is coming out of the closet, as Tim Johnson used to say, Christians are going into the closet, yes. right? We're retreating into our churches. We are uh, not being out there the way that we should. And we are supposed to take that stand. And how we do that, right, again, Frederick Douglass Foundation, righteousness, justice, liberty, and virtue. Those are the four things that, right, that we're trying to do. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, today's guest, you know, he's been walking this, and and we heard it in his bio. We heard it when he introduced what he did. Uh, And then from there, he, he started something that I find to be so intriguing. And he started a church. I mean, here we are, the voice of liberty. We know what this means. And he started a church in the capital region of all places and named it Liberty Christian Fellowship Church. I mean, talk about teaching that biblical charge to leaders to stand up against tyranny and what that means, right? To stand for what is righteous and good. What I'd like, uh, 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 Pastor Earl, again, welcome back. Thank you for sticking with us. If you don't mind telling us a little bit about uh, Liberty Christian Fellowship, but can you also tell us, I mean, this is where, um, you know, I think uh, 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 you could really help us, help our listeners understand what that biblical charge is and if there are any consequences for our peoples who choose not to lead or, or choose not to stand up for others and fight against tyranny and what's not righteous and good. Well, in 2012, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, there was a self-identified jihadist in the program. And he took me to lunch and dinner twice. And the second night, he pokes me in my chest and he says, you, and he's, he's poking me with each syllable. He said, you Americans are doomed because you don't know how to defend your culture. We will use every freedom against you. Now, prior to that time, if someone had asked me, what is America? My answer would have been, well, you know, it's a Christian country. Well, what does that mean? Well, you know, it's mom and apple pie. When he poked me in my chest, a gong went off inside of me. And I said, he's right. Because if we could defend our culture, Obama wouldn't have been president. 
and a whole lot of other things wouldn't be happening to us. I took his hand gently down from my chest, and I said, you're right. We obviously do not know how to defend our culture, but I'm going to figure this out. And when I do, you will be met with resistance. And along the way, with the, uh, that he poked me in my chest in March of 2012, April 2014, on a Saturday night, which is Patriots Day, we started Liberty Christian Fellowship Church because I had realized that America was founded by Puritans. Direct. Puritans were people who, number one, were Bible-believing. Number two, they were born again. Number three, they were living under the active discipleship conviction of the Holy Spirit to live by and administer everything they do according to God's Ten Commandments. And the chief of the Ten Commandments, the most important, are one and two. Because I should think, oh, well, murder is the worst, you know, the, 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 the worst commandment, the one that's the most important, or adultery, because they hurt and wound and mess up so many lives. But the Holy Spirit showed me, oh, you don't, if you're not, the reason the Puritans came to America is because they were one and two people. They were commandments one and two people. They resisted the government enforcement of Catholicism in Europe. They weren't fleeing atheism. Atheists couldn't care less what Christians do. Now they come out of the woodwork and they, they try to taunt, you know, torment us Christians. But in the past, atheists just kind of did their thing and they talked bad about Christ, but they didn't have any political power to be able to do anything. I re realized years ago when I was um, working in town, I ran for city council in my town. I got a whole other story about that in Catholicism. When I, they, asked me, they asked me to convert to Catholicism, both the Republican and the Conservative parties. I was unanimously nominated by the full Republican and Conservative parties. Uh, first person they told me in 35 years that had such an endorsement. Um, and they both, both of these different people, groups of people, 24 in one room, 21 in another room, two different nights asked me, would you convert to Catholicism? I said, why? Both of them said the exact same thing, because the bishops are the backbone of government. I said, how does that work? They said, well, after our main church services in our main cities throughout America, the, the bishops gather informally with the with the politicians from all the parties, and it creates across the aisle cooperation. So I thought, wait a minute. So, that, I don't, hey, Pastor I'm not Earl, I don't go to, yeah. and, and did, so when you started uh, Liberty Christian Fellowship, that was in Albany? Yes. Okay, so... It, in, in Colony, New York, it was a few miles, like four or five miles from Albany. Yeah, it is. Okay, and, and you guys are still there now? Yeah, well, we, we meet yeah, we meet we meet in uh, Saratoga Springs, and we meet in Selkirk, New York. We have two locations. Oh, very nice. I didn't know very that. Nice. You know, you brought up the Puritans, and I, I think that's great because not too many people really know about or understand the role that the Puritans played in this country. As a matter of fact, I think it was Kirk Cameron who, um, who, who yeah, it was Kirk Cameron. He, he made a movie called Monumental that oh, yeah, really, that truly highlights uh, the, the movement and why is it that the Puritans came here and, and really why America started and how it started. Pastor, can we talk a little bit about the biblical charge? Scripturally, what tells us, what commands Christians uh, to stand against tyranny, to stand against what's righteous and good? Well, I don't teach that there is an Old Testament and a New Testament. I teach that what we call the Old Testament are pre-Christ testimonies of God's grace. Adam sins, and God gives him grace. Every, as a matter of fact, everybody in the Old Testament sins. They don't, no one in the Old Testament succeeds by keeping the law. Everybody fails, and they all get grace. That's the Old true. Testament contains the processes of the principles that are explained in the New Testament. Now, there are process and principles in both Testaments, particularly in in Corinthians, you've got a great mixture of process and principle, and in the Book of Acts, a lot of process and principle. But, but, and there's a lot of principle in the Old Testament, too. But Adam sinned, we see God cover him with an animal. We, don't, we, kind of, we kind of start getting a sense God is doing something with blood sacrifice or whatever, but you don't really understand it fully until you read in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So the, the Old Testament is all about the application of the Bible to civics. If Israel had had made sure that the people who ran their government were, were kept Ten Commandments number one and two, their nation never would have gotten dragged off to Nineveh and then Babylon. And um, 
the, the, the problem we have in America is that we, people came here who are not Bible-believing people. We have, our government's being run right now by people who call themselves Christians, but they're not Bible-believing Christians. Well, and how do, so how, how would you say, right, um, again, when we're looking at kind of what Peter, right, the leadership, right, I think, you know, I'm trying to, for, for our listeners and stuff like that, right, that so many people, especially Christians, right? So I know that all of our audience is not Christian. Um, but again, how do you lead in your life, right? When we're talking about those next steps, how do you lead in your life where you're at as a Christian, right? I mean, whether you are a mom that's at home, mm-hmm. right? Whether you are, you know, somebody who is out there in the workplace and we're looking at the landscape of uh, of, of what's happening in our culture and our society, right? And a lot of times what we hear, what I hear, is people saying, well, you know what, I just, you know, have my life. Again, going back to what you said, you know, they're in the church and, you know, yeah, we're singing and praising, but, you know, how how does that, how but, do we move that forward? But, but even for non-Christians, though, when yeah, we yeah, talk yeah. about things like righteousness and good, that's not just a, I mean, it is a Christian virtue, but it, it's just, it's a human nature. It's a good human nature virtue that we should all have. So we well, should we all should, be striving to fight have... for that. Uh, Pastor Earl, your, your, True, your, your but you can't response. be good without God. And, and, and you know what I mean? Like, there's, there's that part. But as far as leading, how do you lead in a way, right? So again, Christians especially are saying that we are not supposed to be part of maybe this world, right? Like, like... like Hey, that's that's not our place. I'm taking care of my family. I'm doing this. I'm working. But you have right. They, some we have our one of our biggest problems is you have, um, you know, fifty percent of Christians aren't voting because they said it's not their place. Yep. Right. Well, you got an entire well, religion. Our, our seminaries, our seminaries teach separation of church and state, and that's not even biblical. And it's certain you can't you can't find Correct. a phrase. Separation of church and state in the U.S. Constitution, and you can't find it in the Bible, because God says, I'm going to judge the nation. Right. And it would be categorically unfair for him to judge that from which he has separated himself. He removes the awareness of his presence, because he, he's judging us at times, but he hasn't separated himself from any other part of his creation. He's going to, he, he's, he's controlling, going to judge everything. You want to know what's happened in America? Read, read, ask the Lord to take the blinders off your eyes. This is for the audience. Ask the Lord to take the blinder off your eyes so you can see the application of the Bible to civics. The whole Old Testament is nothing more than the application of the Bible to mm-hmm. civics. You, you, you let leadership drag you away from God, and God, he, he's bound by the honor of his character to drag your nation down. The history of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is I, the Lord, overthrow the nations because of idol worship. Yes. And idol worship yeah. is not people going out and worshiping their boats. I've been on some fabulous boats on multiple continents. I have not <laughs> seen one boat owner get down and kiss his boat and worship it. What God is talking about is ascribing the values and the characteristics of the Trinity to anything that is not the Trinity. And the main problem we had with that in the United States of America was through Catholicism. It was actually Catholics on the Supreme Court that took the Bible out of our schools. They took prayer out of our schools. And in the 60s, everybody flocked to Catholic schools, realized and teaching people to pray to Mary. So then we started forming our own Christian schools. But we have, we have, we have failed to honor Ten Commandments 1 and 2. We've got sin in the camp. All these people who worship anything that they want to worship, and we, and we accept them. Thinking, oh, we've got to have a broad-based coalition. Uh, you know, so we've got to bring all these atheists and different people in so we can win our country back. No, nope. God s- works to a remnant. Yeah, we can see he it works to a, a remnant who will focus on him. Sorry. Gideon army got whittled down from 32,000 to 300. Did you That's see that statue that just uh, they just put in New York City, oh, a tribute that. to abortion? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, when you're talking, you know, again. Well, look at Revelation. Revelation says the statue's going to cry or bleed or do something. The Catholic Church has got statues all over the world doing that. Yeah, yeah, they go do. Go look at John Wycliffe, and you read my booklet. Go look at John Wycliffe's Jan Hus, um, uh, Calvin. Go to YouTube and just look up the documentaries on those people because what put me onto this was when I was reading one of the founding fathers one day, and he said that John Wycliffe was the father of the American Revolution. I'm like, what? He died 400 years before. What could he possibly have to do with it? Interesting. They called him the morning star of the American Revolution. 
Calvin was, was, was not really a pastor. He was hired as an ad hoc, ad hoc member of the Geneva City Council. They couldn't persecute uh, uh, Calvin because he had an army. From with Geneva, Geneva had an army. They wouldn't let the Catholic Church go in there and force him. To, and Calvin was the, was the first guy in history to form a public uh, education system because he said even poor kids have to read the Bible. Thirst to read the Bible has always driven literacy, and in Bible-based societies, the literacy rate is always above 90%. Yeah, it is. As a matter of fact, reading the Ota, the, you know, using the these and thous and so forth has helped people, like Pastor Jose Rodriguez here locally at Bible Baptist Temple. He talks about that. Yeah. He learned English like that. Yeah. Pa- Pastor... Did you have one more question? No, no, Pastor, I want to ask you one more question. Uh, we're kind of getting towards the end of the interview, and I wanted to make sure we got this in there. This this question is in regards to uh, Mark 12, um, 16 and 17. It, it's where Jesus says, um, a, well, and this Matthew is, uh, I think it's 17, and in Matthew 22, where it says, Pay Caesar what is Caesar's, and pay God's what is God. And I'm gonna. I'd, I'd ask you to please kind of define this, and I'll, and I'll explain in your why. View, right? Yeah, in your view, and, and the reason why I'd like to help this define, and we will ask other pastors as we go, um, is because many of us um, in the grassroots that are that are, are trying to fight the fight, that are going out there every day, uh, you know, between activism work, between our Christian work as chaplains. Sometimes people don't understand that there is a level of of things, I guess, that we have to do, like follow the rules here on the secular world, right? So if yeah. there's taxes that have to be paid, if if the law says that, uh, you know, we've got to do things a certain way, those things, I think, should be followed. And I was hoping, and I think to this is extent. the scripture that says it. Well, yes, as long as what you're being told to well, do I'm doesn't take away about, from yeah, God's we can talk, things. We'll, but, yeah, we'll interject. Uh, uh, Pastor, if you don't mind helping us to find that for our listeners. And ladies and gentlemen, we're listening to Pastor uh, Earl Wallace from Liberty Christian Fellowship Church in the Capital Region. The Bible says render unto Caesar. We're not supposed to render unto God what is Caesar's. Now, in America, our laws are based on Scripture. And, and in that process, our legislatures make laws. I am under, I am under no obligation to obey a governor's um, executive or a president's executive order. An executive order is – the governor is the executive over the workforce of the state of New York. The, the president is the, is the executor of, over the, um, the executive officer – over the, the um, federal workforce, he make they, they make a, they make an edict like that. I'm not going to obey it. Our laws are made by the legislature. Now the legislature is in collusion with them, so they never stand up against us. But if both sides want to violate the process that God gave us, I'm under no obligation to, to violate to, to, to comply with that process. Good process leads to good outcome. The best process, the only process, is is obeying is living by the Ten Commandments. We have a right. See, the Ten Commandments express our, our inalienable rights. They enumerate our they're, inalienable rights. We have a, we have a in Ten Commandments. Say that again. I said they're embodied in our in our United States Constitution. That's right. The founding fathers realized in the Ten Commandment number six, God says, "Thou shalt not murder," which means everybody has the right not to be murdered. So they gave us the Second Amendment right to defend ourselves. And God defended Cain. Cain said, "If you leave somebody to kill me, God said, I'll put a mark on you. you can, no, no, I'll defend you." You know, or maybe gave him the right to defend himself. You, you probably know this, Pastor, but the, the New York State Constitution, uh, the preamble, right in the preamble, it, it invokes God. It says, you know, it asks God for prayer and safety, basically. I don't remember that. I have to bring up those words. Uh, years ago, that. I read that preamble uh, in parts of the New York State Constitution to our church, and they, they were gasping after every line because, like the Mayflower Compact, we don't really know what it says because <laughs> the liars who teach it to us or, or make reference to it, they leave out the salient portion. Yeah, they do. Pastor, well, yeah. uh, Pastor thank you so God. much for your time today. Oh, did we lose you? Is he there? No, I'm still here. Oh, no, you gotcha. Pastor, thank you so much for the time that you spent with us today. I wanted to, uh, b- b- before we, we end the interview, can you tell, you know, for our how listeners, can how can they get involved? How can they get a hold of you? I can guarantee that a good portion of the people that are listening to our show are going to want to know about Liberty uh, uh, Christian Fellowship Church. They're going to want to know how is it that biblically they can fight back um, while still maintaining the things that, that they worked hard for. Uh, How can we're, they get we're in touch at with Liberty you? CS, 
which stands for Christian Fellowship, libertycf.org, and libertycfchurch.org. And you can reach us also at phone number 518-544-7744. Pastor Tink, you thank you so much for taking time from your really busy schedule to, uh, to spend with us here in the Next Step show in good old uh, Livingston County, New York, right outside of the Rochester Metro, well, actually within the Metro Rochester area. And Monroe County. What are the other counties that we reach? Oh, Monroe, uh, Orlean. Uh, yeah, Orleans, uh, Ontario, uh, um, Allegheny, Steuben. Yeah. We're, we're all out. We're all over the place. Yates County. Yep. Pastor, thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again. I think we're going to break, and you want to take us out? You are listening to WYSL, The Voice of Liberty, 92.1 FM, 95.5 FM, and 1040 AM. Third largest AM station in the state. We'll be right back after this. help with health insurance? The Greece Regional Chamber provides assistance with health insurance for businesses, nonprofits, families, and individuals throughout our region. We pride ourselves on the personalized service that we provide for our clients. Let us help you find health insurance plans that fit your needs and navigate the paperwork. Greece Chamber Benefit Partners, located at 2402 Westridge Road in Rochester, New York, offers a broad range of medical insurance plans for businesses, nonprofits, individuals, and families throughout the greater Rochester Finger Lakes region, working with insurance companies including Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield, Univera, and MVP Healthcare. We can also help you access insurance plans through the New York State of Health, the official health plan marketplace. Again, you do not need to live or work in Greece to utilize our brokerage services. We serve the greater Rochester Finger Lakes region of New York State. Visit greasechamber.org to sign up for one of our free health insurance information sessions or schedule an appointment with one of our licensed brokers. Call 585-227-7272. 585-227-7272. Hi, this is attorney Christine Demo Vasquez. For more than 18 years, I've provided quality legal services tailored to the unique needs of each of my clients. I take the time to educate my clients about the law, explain the legal process, listen carefully, answer questions, and keep my clients informed throughout the process. An attorney who understands the complexities of the family court system, call attorney Christine Demo Vasquez at 585-427-0675. 585-427-0675. The fair tax replaces the income tax and abolishes the IRS for good. But that's not going to happen if the current crop of politicians have their way. Fair tax New York is looking for motivated citizens who are willing to contact candidates and get them to sign the fair tax pledge, promising to push for fair tax if elected. Call Fair Tax New York at 585-944-0588. That's 585-944-0588. Make that call today. Peter Vasquez and Aisha Croix, the next step show on the WYSL stations. Echinito, Kale, Alo, Flito, Bien, Flito, De Puerto Rico. You love this song. Dance it up. You know, if we had the camera on, we can have a little, little Spanish party going on. Yeah, my hip though. Every time I do that. Hey, I feel like I'm in like anyone like Dirty Dancing. Remember the the people there, like the old people. <laughs> <laughs> dirty Dancing. This is one of the songs I sang to my wife that uh, you know where I was able to do that little Latino move. So I yeah. told her I'm dedicating this to you, and she's like, "What does it mean?" I'm like, "No, I'm not telling you. You can ask someone else to tell you, <laughs> so, right? Let's see what they say." Get, so, of course so how she does works. she? So how does she find that out? She goes to some like random person and says. Peter does this little thing. What's it mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, she she took the song, uh, to, or she played it for one of her Spanish friends, one of her Spanish co-workers, who, who told her, uh, if I remember correctly, something along the lines of, you got to stay with that guy. He chose a good song. And well, here we are, 18 years later, so must have been a good song. So that's Brujeria and Ojos Chino, so I owe it to El Gran Combo for my 20-year marriage or my 18-year marriage. Yeah. Christine, you might have got soccer. No, I'm joking. 
<laughs> You're my boy. That's me, amigo. I'm joking. I'm joking. Me, so, me, 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 I was... Me. Come on, you know? He's like my brother, you know, from another mother. You and Mike Peace, you know? Before we, um, before we I, keep that uh, discussion, though, I did want yes. to point out, because he was uh, Pastor Earl, a, a great conversation. He is, or he did a lot of work with veterans, and it just got me thinking that maybe we should put this out again yeah. one more time. So, I just want to... If there's anybody out there, any veterans or family members, or if you know of a veteran that is just right now in crisis, uh, uh, either because of mental health or even physical health, whatever the case may be, but they need help, feel free to call the Veterans Crisis Line by dialing 988. I mean, 988. Let me articulate that correctly. 988. From your phone, that's it. That's all you got to dial and, and just either say I need help or say you know somebody that's help. Well, they can call at number 2, uh, 1-800-273-8255, and they can even text 838255. Mm. Don't let a veteran, don't let anybody. Veteranscrisisline.net. Absolutely. That's where you can get all the contact info, too. And if you know a veteran, check in on them. Every day, if you right? can. I, and we talked about that last week. Don't yeah. let... I mean, if, if you waited two days to check on a veteran or to check on your neighbor, period, yeah. right? Uh, you waited too long. Yeah. And that could make the difference. So what about Caesar? I should... I, I, yeah, you know, I know we... Um, I don't know why I thought that we had less time. But, you know, rendering under Caesar's what was Caesar's and, um, you know, part of that, you know... I, me and you may disagree a little bit here, um, but part of that brilliant um, reply that uh, Jesus gave was be- right is before he said anything, he said, "Who's inscribed on that coin?" Yep. Right. Yep. He asked for that, and and there's a reason, right? A that points out he didn't have the coin, right? Because there's very few people that would. Um, uh, uh, have that coin, and that was just because of when that coin being money, and they were referring to taxes. Correct, and but it was specifically Roman money, right? right. So the Roman, you know, the denarius, Caesar's face and bust was on there, and it was undeniable, right? Like each um, time some a, a new um, Caesar came in, basically, right? They changed the face. They would change the face of of that coin, and then the churches, though, again, this goes back to when he was talking about the money changers, they would bring that coin to the church, and the church would exchange that money for money that could be given to the church because they didn't want Caesar's face on that. Do you know what I mean? And so giving rent, so yes, absolutely, we have a, 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 a obligation, right, according to Scripture, to give Caesar what is Caesar's, right? But everything else is to God's. It doesn't say that we're supposed to give to Caesar everything that he asks. Correct. Right? We have a... Um, you know, something that we're supposed and, to do. And but. next week in the beginning, we'll talk a little bit more about that because I do want to expand. But, Bob, I think it's time for... Take my now, Free Soup with Aisha Kreutz. So, Free Soup, good for liberty, good for your soul. And today, a cautionary tale. A 10-year-old, a 10-year-old girl asks mom, Mommy, how was I born? The mother smiled and replied, Once upon a time, me and your daddy decided to plant a wonderful little seed. Daddy put it in the earth and took care of it every single day. After a while, the seed started to grow more and more leaves, and in a few months it turned into a beautiful, healthy plant. So we took the plant, dried it, smoked it, and got so high, we forgot to wear a condom. (laughs) Oh, man. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is Free Soup with Aisha Kreutz. Oh, my God. Never, ever cease to amaze me. I think I'm going to have to start pre-approving some of these, huh? No, I'm just kidding. That was good. That was... Hey, a little nonsense now and then is relished by the <laughs> wisest men. And that's true, right? It definitely uh, is. About planting the seed in the earth and smoking it, I, I don't know about that. Well, I, we have I, to do some deep background. I, I wonder if that parent uh, actually saw the stork coming in with the baby. They probably did. <laughs> Depends on the. But that would probably with. be LSD, exactly. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to the Next Step <laughs> Show. You know you can advertise with us. Remember, we reach a ton of people. We go all over the place. Remember, we're the well, we aren't, but we are on a station that's run by a phenomenal leader oh, who's taken this station to be the third largest same station. 
station and number one FM station. And don't forget, Aisha and I, if it matters to you, we are the only black and brown folks sitting on the airways. In the talk format. In the talk format. Anywho, advertise with us. Check out our website. Y que tengan una semana bendecida. We appreciate you. And until next week. Otra mujer.